Turn up your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We'll be continuing in there today. Uh, now that I retired the other day, I was sitting, sitting in my chair just pondering life, thinking, I wonder if there's something else I could do. And one of the thoughts that came to mind was, you know, I, I could be a person who inspects mirrors. That's really a job I could see myself doing. <laughs> just came to mind. I don't know. It's kind of weird. I get some weird thoughts sometimes. All right, Romans 12. We were reading in Romans 12 this time last week. We talked a lot about conformity. We're going to continue there today and talk about something else that Paul mentions. Beginning in 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and imperfect will of God. As we consider this text today, several questions will come to mind, right? What, what does it mean to be transformed? We talked a little bit about this last week. We were talking more about conformity, not being conformed to the world, what that means to be conformed to the world. But as Christians, we are to be nonconformists. We are not to be conformed to the things of the world. We are to be conformed to the ways of Christ, to be like Christ. And that is a process, and we're going to talk about that today. It's a transformation. It's something that we go through. We're just not automatically like Christ. In fact, we never really become like Christ. He was the only one that lived perfectly in the flesh, right? We can't do that. We're in the flesh. But we, through the Word, through our prayer, through our service, through our growth, we become more like Him, hopefully, every day. What is it about this? Well, what do we mean by transformation? The word, particularly in the Greek, is metamorpho, to change it to another form. Right? Metamorphosis is what you might have heard before, and it's used to describe a change of form. Most, probably the most best example is you know, uh, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. He metamorphs. He morphs into a butterfly, a beautiful creature, just changes, right? We use that to describe, we use that word to describe that. And in the New Testament, the word is also used to describe what happened to Jesus at the Mount, at the Mount of Transfig at the Transfiguration. If you want to read about that, let's go back to Matthew chapter 17 and let's see what was said about that. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. This is the Transfiguration. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. <clears throat> his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Now, this is an interesting passage, right? I mean, Jesus' body wasn't changed, but something about his presence, his, um, his skin shone, right? As if there was a light emanating from him. And, and we know God to be light, right? He is love. He's so many things, but he is a great light. In fact, heaven will be illuminated, is illuminated by his great light. And this is what we're seeing here. Jesus is being transfigured from his fleshly presence to his godly presence, showing the disciples who he truly was, right? Being transfigured before them, changed to another form. Well, what is it that happens to Christians in their service to God? through this idea of being transformed. Paul is talking about here, Christians are to undergo a complete change, which under, which under the power of God will fill expression in character and in conduct. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, we are caterpillars, and we are becoming butterflies. Not overnight, not something that happens immediately, but it's something that happens over time. I want you to notice something, though, in this verse. Paul is using the pass passive voice, right? It's not the uh, singular pronoun. Or, he's talking about something being done to us. Uh, we submit to God's power, and by His grace, something happens to us. Turn over to 2 Corinthians, uh, and let's read the passage from 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5. Second, and, and there's about three, chap, three or four chapters in the first part of 2 Corinthians where Paul describes this uh, thoroughly, what this transformation process is and so forth. And I uh, don't have time to read all of that, but it's a great study on how we are being transformed, how we are 
changed. Uh, 2, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse, uh, so we'll just read 16 there. He says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Did you know when you became a Christian, you were created anew? I don't mean physically. You didn't become a new babe. But you became a new babe in Christ, spiritually speaking. You became a new creation in the spirit, not in the flesh. Interesting, right? We were changed into another form. Whether you realize that or not, that's what happened at your conversion. Well, what's the goal then? What are we to look forward to? What are we to do about this? Well, mentioned it already, we are to become like Christ. There, stay there in 2 Corinthians and move over to chapter 3. I want to see something else that Paul wrote there. Chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, beginning in verse 12. He says, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on the heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What is Paul talking about there? Well, Moses went on the mount to get the tablets. He talked with God. Let's go read about it. Turn over to Exodus chapter 34. Let's just see what he's talking about there to remind ourselves. I know you know the story, but let's just go read about it anyways. Exodus 34, and beginning in verse 29. Exodus 34, verse 29. Now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Interesting how that happened, kind of like the transfiguration, right? So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them his commandments, all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with them, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. What's going on there? What is happening with Moses and, and that interaction, interaction with God there? When he's going in to speak with him, the light of God is changing him. It's making his face shine. Now, I'm not by any means saying he's God or anything, but Moses was an archetype of Jesus in the Old Testament. He was a symbol of Jesus, and he is being changed because he's in the presence of God. He comes before the Israelites, and they see him, and they're afraid because he's changed. They can see it, right? But then Paul goes on and talks about the fact that Moses had to veil his face, though. Have you ever read that story and thought Moses veiled his face as soon as he came down because the people were afraid of him? Have you ever thought that? I've thought that before. I got that wrong, right? That's not why he did that. Paul explains it here in 2 Corinthians. He says, it's not because his face was changed. He didn't veil himself because of that. Notice when he went back to see God, he took it off. And when he was speaking, he didn't have the veil on. He was acting. He was commanded, it says, and he told 
the Israelites what God had spoke to him. What Paul is saying is, we are being transformed, just like Moses was. We are now that light, not physically shining like Moses did or Jesus when he was transfigured, but we are now the hope of the world. We are now shining before the world. We now come before the world speaking as we are commanded, just like Moses was. What's Paul saying? And through Christ, there is now no longer a need for a veil. Moses wore the veil because it faded. Under the Old Testament, we understand that. We can look back now and see the law was fading. The Mosaic law was going to go away. It was only temporary. That shining of his face only lasted for a little while. And then it faded away. And he veiled himself because he didn't want the Israelites to see it fading. But it did. Paul's saying, through Christ now we are transformed into eternity. And that shining light will last forever. It's not going to fade. We no longer need the veil like Moses did. You understand that? We are being transformed to be like Christ. This is expressed by Paul. Romans 8, 29. Paul talks to the Roman church as being, this was the foreknowledge of Christ, of, of God, to be predestined, to be his workmanship, to be his servants. Luke 6, verse 40. The Lord talks about the purpose of being a disciple, to become like his teacher, the goal of Christian living. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3. Let's read something there. Colossians chapter 3. And uh, verse 8. <clears throat> Paul writing to the brethren in Colossae says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free. But Christ is all and in all. As Christians, we are being transformed from the way we were. No longer dealing with things in the flesh, but putting our mind on things in the Spirit. Becoming like Christ, who was in the flesh, but lived in the Spirit. We already talked about in Romans 12, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. It's not us that are living. We are to sacrifice ourselves for the work of Christ. Isn't that what Jesus did on earth? Hebrews 10 tells us that. We are to prove that God's will is good and imperfect, acceptable and perfect. Jesus taught the disciples to do that. We are to demonstrate that God's will is correct. That should be our goal. The world is going to look at you and say, you're stupid. You're an idiot. There is no God. But we are here to be that light like Moses' face, unveiled, shining in a dark world. That's the goal, to be transformed. It's the goal of being a Christian. Well, if that's true, why do many experience the transformation that God offers and yet remain caterpillars, yet don't grow? You know, that happens, right? There are many who said they repented, they confessed the Lord's name, they've been washed in the blood of Christ, baptized into his name, and yet they never really change. You know people like that. You know some in your families. Do you have some friends like that? I, I don't, there's quite a few people here. I would say there's some here right now that are in that form. Good point. Don't completely surrender to the Lord. They have to be motivated, don't they? There is a motivation that maybe they don't understand truly. What is that? What is that motivation that we can seek to help us be transformed? Turn over to Romans chapter 6. Let's read some of those things that should motivate us. Romans chapter 6, beginning verse 15. <clears throat> what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. 
Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Speak in terms of because of, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, but just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now I present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. As Christians, we are being transformed into Jesus' likeness to the point where we are no longer slaves to that sin. We no longer want to sin. Yeah, it's, we're going to fall short. It's going to happen. We're in the flesh. But we should be motivated not to sin, to remove that from our lives. And when you're struggling with something in your life, you go to Him. You see the example. We are to be slaves of righteousness, not slaves of sin. Freedom from sin. We got that mercy, right? Verse 23 there, what's it say? For the wages of sin is death, <clears throat> but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's promised it. We have a promise of eternal life. Do you want that? Is that what you want in your life? Do you want to be having that hope of eternity, having the peace that goes with that and the joy? That's a mercy we have. That should motivate you. Romans 5, read another, another something else that should motivate us. Romans 5, verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. You're going to have peace. If you're living in the Spirit, if you're a slave of righteousness, you're going to have a peace. A peace that knowing you're saved. A peace that knowing you are a child of God. Knowing that you have an inheritance coming. Verse 2, through, through whom also we have access by faith <clears throat> into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access to His grace. Verse 9, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Through him. Grace is a lot better than wrath, isn't it? Amen. We have that mercy. We have that grace that will save us from his wrath when we believe in him, when we are transformed into his likeness. Shouldn't his mercy move us? Shouldn't his grace move us to be transformed, to seek transformation, to repent of our sins? And walk in the Spirit. What else should motivate us? Turn over to 2 Corinthians again. I should have told you to stay there. I'm sorry. But go back over to chapter 5. I'm going to read something else. Chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> verse 12. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ. Wait a minute, what, what was that? For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No greater love hath a man than lay down his life for his brother, friend, for sinners. There's no greater love than that. He loved us so much that he died for you. Therefore, we should be motivated to live like him. No longer for ourselves, but for him. No longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. No longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. Such love compelled Paul to live for Jesus. Galatians 2, verse 20 said, The life I live, 
is no longer mine, right? I've been crucified with Christ. Yet not I, but Christ that lives with me. That should be what you say too. That should be where you're getting to if you're not. You should be living a life that's not for yourself, it's for Christ. I'm going to tell you, when you wake up in the morning, is he on your mind? When you go to bed at night, is he the last person you think about? The last thing you think about? Well, I know, I got, I got kids, I got to get up, I got to get them from school, I got to go to work, I got too many things to do, I don't have time. Oh. When you're being transformed into the Spirit, you're going to make the time. Did you know that? You're going to make the time. You're going to remove the things that impede you from having a relationship with Christ. That's the motivation you should have. What's the alternative? What's the alternative? Being conformed. Greek word is suskimatiso. In the in the verse, uh, verse 1 and 2 uh, of chapter 12, it implies that which is changeable or unstable. At most, we can only be an imitation when we don't transform to be like Christ. Cheap copy. If not transformed, we're going to be conformed to the world. We're going to act like the world. We're going to be like those in the world. And as actors, as a cheap copy, we're going to bring shame to Jesus. You ever thought about that? When you do things that are of the world, but yet act like you're of the Spirit, you're going to bring shame. It may not happen today, but it's going to happen. You ever heard the phrase, your sins will find you out? <laughs> oh, I, I know about that. I, I have that happen. I'm sure pretty much everybody in here has been through that process one time or another. If you're not transforming to be like Christ, you're conforming to be like the world. Outwardly, we may like act like Christians, but appear like them even. But it will just be superficial. Eventually, it we're going to reveal our true nature, right? Is that what we want? To bring shame to the cross? To be a plastic Christian, or do you want to be the real thing? Why not let? Why, why not let the mercies, the promises, the love of Christ motivate you to be transformed? Why not? The process is not as tough as you might think, really. Yeah, it may seem tough, it may seem hard. But with motivation, we can do it. What's this process all about, actually? I already mentioned once, the transformation is a passive process. He says, be transformed. He didn't say transform yourself. He says, be transformed. We cannot change ourselves by our own strength and our own meritorious work. Can't be done. Remember, we studied Romans 7 a couple weeks ago. Verses 14 through 24, Paul is talking about he does the things he doesn't want to do. And the things he wants to do, he doesn't do them. It's this thing about being in the flesh. We can't control it sometimes. We do things we wish we'd never done. We fall short. That should help motivate us as well. We need to submit to God. As Alicia mentioned, surrender to him. Let him do his work on us. It begins when we're baptized into Christ, Colossians 2. We're spiritually circumcised, Colossians 2, verses 11 through 13. We are circumcised by a circumcision without hands, buried with Christ into his death and raised to newness of life. Made alive with Christ, forgiven of our trespasses, set to walk in Him in the Spirit. Titus 3, we read about the fact that we are regenerated by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, verses 3 through 8, we read about that walk in newness of life, having been buried with Him, having been crucified with Him, that we might be free from sin. 
We join with faith and repentance. Baptism becomes that starting point in which the transformation takes place. I dare say most everybody here has been baptized. There might be one or two of you that haven't. Have you seen a transformation in your life? Or are you still stuck back there when you got baptized? Are you still struggling with sin in your life? Or have you moved past it? It starts with this process of renewing the mind. We mentioned it there in in verse 2 in our text. Unless there's a renewing of the mind, any change will be superficial. Renewing the mind is made possible when we set our minds on certain things. Colossians 3, setting our minds on the things above. Romans 8, 5, setting our minds on things of the Spirit, not the flesh. Acts 2, 42, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, having fellowship with one another, breaking bread from house to house, feeding our minds with the Word of God, being in prayer, fellowship with one another. That's one of the reasons we come here. To renew our minds. Hopefully everybody here is like in mind, right? Hopefully everybody here is for the same reason, to worship our God, our Creator, our Savior, our Lord. We help each other. That's what we need to be putting in our minds, renewing it. Putting off the old man and putting on the new man, Colossians 3, by living according to the Spirit. It's a process, but it's really quite simple. When we set our minds on things above, in order to renew our mind, we are meditating and contemplating on God and His Word. Do you do that? Or is this the only time you ever open your Bible when you're in class on Sunday morning? I know, I'm speaking to the choir. There's a lot of people still in bed right now. I know that. But is this the only time you ever read the Word? How are you going to renew your mind if that's it? Half of you are out there asleep right now, I know. Your minds are on something else. I know that. Keep your mind in communication with God. How? Through prayer. I don't know how that works exactly, but He wants you to do it. He wants you to pray. He says, ask and I'll give. Why wouldn't you want to do that? That's another one of those motivating things. How are you going to transform if you're not talking to God? When you were a kid, did you want to be like your dad? When you had kids, did they want to be like you? I remember thinking my dad was Superman. Found out he wasn't a little while later, but I thought he was. I remember the first time my son, I heard he told somebody, my dad could do anything. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. My son thinks that, you know. Now he thinks I'm an idiot, but that's another thing. No, I'm just kidding. If you want to be like your father, you got to talk to him. And you got to hear him talk to you. If you're going to be transformed. We renew our minds, it becomes possible to put off the old and put on the new. That's how it works. We put off the old man with its sins, we put on the new man, patterned after the example of Christ. I can't say that enough. It's to be like him. He gave us the example. Many modern studies and self-improvement confirm this. This is a truth. We become what we think. You've heard the thing, you are what you eat. You are what you think. And if you're putting stuff in your mind that's not becoming, you're going to become like the world. We can change attitudes and behaviors by filling our mind with positive mental images. In our efforts, we are not alone. As I already mentioned, God is at work with us. Turn over to Philippians chapter 1. I want to read a fascinating verse, passage of verses here. Philippians chapter 1. And Philippians is another great study. It's so uplifting. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. And I'm going to begin in verse 3. Paul writing to the church of Philippi says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always, in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel. There's that fellowship thing, like-minded, from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
Has he begun a good work in you? He has me. I've seen it. I've seen the change. I know he's at work in my life. Is he at work in your life? Are you seeing it? You should. Is there fruit coming from your life? I I know you may not see the fruit all the time. There there may not be the results, but when he's at work in your life, you're going to produce fruit. It's just going to happen. That's the way it works in this world. That's the way he created it. Has he begun a good work in you? What hinders many Christians? Well, many Christians remain caterpillars because they're not regenerated at baptism. I mean, well, they were regenerated at baptism, but they kind of stopped. We just hung, you know, get baptized, you hang you up to dry, and that's it. Don't they have the promise of God's help? Of course they do. Promise likely a failure to renew the mind. Can a mind be renewed on a starvation diet? Nope. You got to study. You got to be in the Word every day. Can a mind be renewed on a junk food diet? We eat a lot of junk food, don't we? Do you spend your time in study? Or do you spend your time watching trashy movies on TV? Spend your time reading trashy books or looking at things on the internet that you shouldn't be looking at. Filling your mind with junk. Perhaps that's a problem. But that's what's keeping you from transforming. If you're going to renew your mind, you've got to think on things above, in the Spirit. You've got to be in the Word. We become what we think, and what and much of what we think about is not becoming. We spend more time watching things of the devil than reading things of the Spirit. You know, we may say sometimes, well, that, I, can, I can do this, or I can watch that. I, I can handle something like that. But if it's coming from Satan, why would we want to? I know I'm getting loud, and i got to watch this myself. But perhaps we need to rethink that. Filling our mind with the Spirit, not with the flesh. Our attitude and behavior are but a reflection of what goes into our mind. We've been called to be transformed into the image of Christ. We have all the motivation we need, right? God's mercy. Christ's love. We have the opportunity to start anew by the washing of regeneration. To do that, we have to allow our minds to be renewed by setting it on things above. Say, how do I do that? How, How do I set my mind on things above? It's really simple. Be in the Word. Be in prayer. Get to work. Be of service. Whatever that is, you have a gift. That's very scriptural. Every person in there has a gift by, from God that you can use in service. If you're not sure what that is, figure it out. Start doing stuff. See what it is. Be in prayer about it. Constantly renewing your mind. You say, well, I, I'm struggling with something now. I can't, I'm having trouble getting out of a a temptation that just overwhelms me. Get your partner if you have to. Get a prayer partner. You may need to find somebody that you need to talk to about it in private. We have elders, leaders here, willing to help. They're just in the flesh too. They understand that. They understand how people struggle with certain things. We're here to help each other. And ultimately, we have God who's at work in us who we can go to at any time, who loves you. Yeah, there's going to be a judgment. His wrath is going to come out on those who do not believe. But remember, he loves you. Do you ever actually uh, think about that? Do you understand that? He loves you. For some reason, he loves you so much that he sent his son. Scripture says he wove you in your mother's womb. He knew you then. Think of all the people that have lived on the earth. I've been reading in the Kings and Chronicles and the battles that the kings went through. And every time there's a battle, you know, somebody's raising up. We had 800,000 against their 400,000. Well, that was 
four or five thousand years ago. You know, half of them were dead. How many people in the world now? I don't know, six or seven billion or something. Think of all the people that have passed. I mean, it's, it's, it's unfathomable. It's more than you can think of. Yet God loved every one of them. So much so that he sent his son to die for them. And you. We tend to get a little personal, and that's fine. We should. We need to be personal with him. But he knows everybody. And he knows you better than yourself. And if you're not becoming like him, God wants us to give, God wants to give us a complete <laughs> makeover. He provided this means through Jesus' blood to remove the deformity of sin. We are deformed when we have sin in our life. God didn't design us to be sinners. When he created Adam and Eve in the garden, it was perfect. He said it was good. He created it and he designed it to be that way. But he gave them a choice. He allowed them to make the decision whether they wanted to live for him or for themselves. And sin came into the world because of that. Deformed his, desi deformed his design. Therefore, if we are to live according to his design, we have to turn our lives over to him to be transformed. Let him work on us. He provides the tools, Bible study, prayer, fellowship, and it will fashion a new person. Many of you can look back over your lives and say, I'm completely different than I was 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Right? Even those who might have been raised in the church, right? You still see a difference because you've been transformed into his likeness more and more every day. And that's going to continue until the day you die. We make a good use of his mercies. He gave us the tools. Use them. I'm going to encourage you this week to be in the Word every day. And if you're not sure where to go, just start at the beginning. I did that this year. I started that Genesis 1, and I've been reading through the whole thing. Just started. I said, God, just tell me what you want me to hear. And that's what I'm doing. It's fascinating to go back and read the Old Testament. The things you forgot about or the things you don't remember or maybe you never saw. Fascinating. And it had to give you strength. Light of God's wonderful grace, there is our reasonable, our reason, our reasonable service, right? Will we not prove to the world that God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect as Christians is transformed into his likeness? As we end today, I hope if you're not a Christian, you've heard about him, and you'll make the decision to become a Christian today. You need to start right now. And before we leave today, I want to go to God in prayer one more time as we are going to have a worship service today, and I hope you are uplifted by it. I hope you are encouraged by it. And I hope your love for him and for each other grows abundantly. Let's go to God. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us to be together, to be in worship to you, Father, and to be in, your, in fellowship with one another. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ, who has given us uh, the ability to have an expectation of eternal life, Father, who shed his blood for us that we might be slaves of righteousness, no longer slaves to sin, Father, that we might live an abundant life while here on earth and a hope and have a hope of eternity that is so just so great and so motivating, Father. Father, we fall short. We're in the flesh. We have sin in our lives, and we ask you to help us with that, to forgive us, uh, to be continually reminded that we need you in our lives. We can't do it alone. And we thank you so much for your mercy, for your grace, and for the things that you have done for us, Father. Help each and every person to be comforted here in your, in, uh, in your life, Father, in, in their uh, being a child of God, that they might continue to be transformed, be more like you, and to be forgiven of sin, and to be uh, better examples to the world in uh, their daily lives and the things they say. Uh, forgive us, Father, for we do fall short, and help us out when we're in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here. You are dismissed.